Hello and welcome to Film de Siècle, the film and media channel focused on all things 90s and 2000s. This week, Seb and Ollie will be discussing... Mrs. Doubtfire. Hello and welcome to Film de Siècle, the film and media discussion channel where we talk about all things 1990s to 2000s. My name's Seb, and I'm here with Ollie. Hello. And this week we are watching Mrs. Doubtfire. Yes, yes, we are. I think everybody's seen Mrs. Doubtfire. It's just one of those timeless films that so many people have watched and have fond memories of. Once again, I hadn't seen it till I watched it with you. You chose like, it. At least not in... F- no, it was on that list that <laughs> that we drafted. What were you? Like some sort of Amish kid who wasn't allowed near technology? I was a bit of a weird kid. If it wasn't yeah. animated, I didn't want to know. I'll say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, that's why I, I didn't watch The Matrix when everyone was ra- raving about it. The cover looked a bit too dark and depressing for me. <laughs> so I, I like that's what I would um, gauge stuff off as a kid. Because my dad bought us an N64 for Christmas one year. I was very oh, yeah. young, right? Yeah, I had an N64. And the two cartridges we had were Super Mario 64 yeah. and Zelda Ocarina of Time. Yeah. Now, Super Mario 64 was really bright and colourful on the cartridge. Oh, yeah, well, Whereas it's... Zelda Ocarina of Time had a black and gold colour scheme. So guess which one I wanted to play all the time? Super Mario 64. Yeah, even though I, um, a year later would have laughed at that because I liked Ocarina of Time so much more than that. Oh, it's such a good game, honestly. Um, it, it was, yes. <laughs> but yeah, there was the Animatrix. If you like animated stuff, you could have gone with the Animatrix. I was today years old when I knew of that. I've never heard of that before. It was an anthology series of short films set in the Matrix universe in different animation styles. Oh. Sounds intriguing. It is intriguing. I think it was released a couple of years after the Matrix yeah. movies. I think, um, as, apart from Star Wars, which uh, was always the exception, the first live-action film I probably got into was actually probably The Mummy. So, And, well, there's also the fact that we didn't have that many comedies, like, strictly speaking, on video in my house. Well, it was weird. My first exposure to Mrs. Doubtfire was my stepbrother... Um, dressing up as a woman uh, to become your babysitter. No, no he he uh, really liked the film, although I never watched it. And uh, the all I knew about it was the title Mrs. Doubtfire, and it didn't sell me. So <laughs> no, I must admit I had a similar thing when I was very young because I saw the cover, and for some reason it frightened me because Mrs. Doubtfire was doing the air guitar thing with the broom, and for some reason her expression looked really aggressive. So I thought this was meant to be some sort of scary movie where Mrs. Doubtfire murders people. Yeah. I don't know yeah. why it scared me. I was about three at the yeah. time. Obviously, yeah. I've watched it since, and I'm glad I did. But this is just such a nice movie. I mean, everything that you could accuse Bicentennial Man of doing wrong, this movie does right. Uh, I'm looking forward to exploring that later. <laughs> yeah, because it's... Well, a similar movie in a lot of respects. They're both Chris Columbus movies starring Robin Williams. They're both family films. Uh, They're both quite sentimental and about relationships and uh, who people are at heart. There's not really any alienation of the audience. They really run the gambit well of making everybody the right level of likeable or sympathetic. It's not a movie where there's... Yeah, it's not a movie where there's Bradley Whitford-style cartoonish villains or anything silly or over the top. It's very nuanced and realistic and true to life in the way this family are dealing with the troubles they're going through. Yeah, in fact, if anything, the most outlandish part of it is Mrs. Doubtfire herself. Yeah, because she's this larger-than-life character brought to life by the dad of uh, these three kids in order to spend time with them. Yeah. (laughs) And it's totally in character because he's a voice actor who voices cartoon characters for a living. Yeah. Or did at least until he took a moral standpoint against cigarettes being marketed to children. I like that. I couldn't think of a better way to make a character sympathetic immediately. Yeah. I am. From what I remember from when we watched it years ago, 
yeah, I, I felt the same. Yeah. Uh, so what are your memories, having only watched it the once? I remember the aforementioned moral stance against the cigarettes. Yeah. And how he, um, you know, the whole, oh, my lungs are blackening. <laughs> yes, that was brilliant. Yeah. I remember the scene where he, the the kids catch on and he has to tell them what's happening. Yeah. Uh, and this is the first two, because the first two know earlier on and the little one played by Mara Wilson doesn't find out until very near the end. Oh, that was Mara Wilson. Didn't you know? No, I From didn't. From Miracle of 34th Street and... Uh, Matilda. Matilda, yeah. Largely, Matilda is largely where I know Mara Wilson from. Mind you, it has also been a while since I saw that, so maybe that's why I didn't recognise it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I remember that bit. I remember the cake face. Oh, uh, yes, yes, when Mrs. Doubtfire disguises herself. I remember the guy that makes the masks, and, you know, it's art to hear. He's really invested in it. I found that oddly endearing. Harvey Firestein. Ah who was also known for being in BoJack Horseman that one time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Harvey Firestein. I just love his <laughs> voice. Uh, apparently he did accidentally damage his vocal cords while doing a musical once, and that's why his voice sounds like that. But I just love it. It's so raspy and unusual and endearing. I don't know what it is. It's just such a good voice. Uh, he's he's made the best of damaged vocal cords, certainly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Gotta love him. Yeah. Gotta love him. So yeah, I remember that. I remember basically how the movie ends. I remember help is on the way, dear. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Pierce Brosnan yeah. being... Well, I remember Robin Williams hating Pierce Brosnan for understandable reasons, even though he's not that bad a guy. Yeah, well, that's what I like about that. They very easily could have made him some sort of arsehole Bradley Whitford character. Not to say that Bradley Whitford's an arsehole in real life. I'm just saying that he's typecast in those roles. Yeah. And they don't. I mean, he insults um, Daniel the one time when talking to this other guy, and that's just based on what he knows about him. That's not based on anything personal. Yeah, well... That's based on what he heard from his ex-wife, who probably has a bad opinion of him at that point. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all he's going by. And of course, later on, his life is saved by said ex-husband. Um, yeah. But I um, like that he's not well, an arsehole. He's just a normal guy who has a Mercedes and looks like Pierce Brosnan. Yeah, the film just sort of trusts you to be on Robin Williams' side on by virtue of his situation being sympathetic, sort of, uh, yeah. and doesn't have to make a cartoon or pantomime villain out of the new guy in order to accomplish this. And I like that. <laughs> it demonstrates confidence by the filmmakers, I think. And you've told me about some deleted scenes that I still haven't seen. Like, should I have watched those before? Or I'll tell like... you what, we're going to do something a little bit unusual that we don't usually do on Film to Seattle. Like, I'm going to recommend we watch those deleted scenes after we watch the movie. Right, yeah, and then we record the thoughts. And the reason why is because a lot of people don't give the editing process the credit it deserves in making a movie great. I mean, yeah. the pacing, the order of the scenes, uh, well, deciding which scenes are right for the movie and which ones aren't. All of this is so important to actually making a movie good. For example, I think the original Star Wars movie was a bit of a train wreck until it went through the editing process. Some scenes were refilmed and some scenes were taken out or moved about, and then it ended up being a good movie. And Mrs. Doubtfire is one of those. If you watch these deleted scenes, it could have been a flop if some of these were kept in. It's amazing how removing oh. just a few scenes and maybe adding in a few more uh, can make all the difference from a movie being bad or being timeless. It's remarkable. Well, you've intrigued me. Yeah, so let's go away, watch this movie, and then watch the deleted scenes. Yes, let's. Yeah, okay. See you in a bit. And we're back in the room having watched Mrs. Doubtfire. So, Ollie, what did you think of the movie? Yeah, it was good. It was good. I liked it. It was a very... Uh, one thing that struck me is um, it was a very fair film to all the characters involved. Yeah, and it was a tough balancing act because it's difficult to make characters the right amount of flawed but also the right amount of sympathetic. Yeah, and I think this film pulls off that balancing act very well. 
Yeah, and it's a good movie in terms of it knows that it's got to treat both its main character fairly, but everybody else fairly as well. Yeah, I mean, there is, there is no antagonist to this movie. It's an ugly situation, and like nobody's quite perfect in it. Yeah, and I wish there were more movies like this. Uh, I'm glad there wasn't an antagonist, because there very nearly was. Yeah, you've shown me the deleted scenes, <laughs> and we'll get to those. I... Yeah, we'll talk about that later in a special segment. Um, for what I assume is a children's movie, it was very candid. Like, divorce gets ugly, and... It's it's not a nice thing to go to to go through for anyone, and I like that, especially towards the beginning. There was no vindictiveness in yeah. anything that happened. Oh, I've forgotten the main character's name. <laughs> Daniel. Daniel. I, I, why why did I want to say Richard? Oh, no. <laughs> da- Daniel is clearly um he clearly has some problems as a parent. Like he, you can see why he'd be very difficult to live with. That animal party thing, definite grounds for divorce there. <laughs> and, yeah, um, I honestly can't blame Sally Field. Yeah, not not at all. Yeah, he clearly doesn't realise the extent to which he's being irresponsible. Like, he walks out on a paying job because he doesn't like that a cartoon bird is smoking, and I, can, I get that, but also stuff like that happens. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we are on his side, don't get me wrong. And Yeah, that that's a really good way to set him up as instantly sympathetic in that he walks out on a job that he finds morally reprehensible, or he finds certain aspects of it morally reprehensible. Yeah, that intro scene couldn't do a better job of making us like the main character. But yeah. it also unintention- well, in- intentionally sets up for later that it's things like this that mean that he's between jobs a lot of the time, and that's not good for the family. Yeah, and possibly because he's between jobs all the time, the wife is working all the time to keep things stable. Now, we don't know that she wouldn't be the career gal and be busy all the time anyway. Yeah. But, you know, he goofs off a lot, and that's kind of... It's both part of the charm and part of the problem, isn't it? Well, yeah, she says in the beginning that he takes all the fun and doesn't leave any for her. And it's like, and he sets her up intentionally or not as the bad guy in the family. Like the one that's always the killjoy. And that's not fair. Because somebody needs to be at the end of the day. Well, if one of the parents never takes anything seriously and goofs off all the time, yeah, one of you needs to be. That's not a balanced structure. Yeah. When the donkey eats the cake, that's when the fun needs to stop. Yeah. I don't Unless it's Shrek. Unless it's Shrek, that's fine. I don't know why she shooed that poor pony away. Just let it have oh. the cake at that point. Oh no. Oh, but give no one else is gonna want that cake. No one else is gonna want that cake. Just let the poor pony have the cake. Aww <laughs> <laughs> Is that the director's cut of Marie Antoinette? <laughs> let the pony eat cake. Oh let them eat cake. Yeah, let the pony eat cake. Let the pony eat the cake. I mean, it's already had half of it, and you're not going to find anyone else who's willing to eat after a pony, so... I I like how the character who's most sympathetic in this movie is the pony. (laughs) (laughs) I don't care what I had a lot of sympathy for the pony. Yeah, I'd give the pony a cake. At least a slice. At least a slice. (laughs) Aw. That's a, do, yeah. do, do ponies like cakes in real life? I'm not sure. I'm going to look that up at some point. It'd probably be a bad idea to feed a pony a cake. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if the cake would do damage to the pony, then yeah, shoo the pony away. But <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Well, anyway, what were we talking about? <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. I mean, that was some Family Guy level shit that he pulled for the son's birthday party. Yeah, and I think I said something when we were watching it that. <laughs> but, I mean, if police show up, you've gone too far. This makes shows like Family Guy look really ridiculous because you've got. I mean, to be fair, r- they're supposed to look really ridiculous. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that is the point. You're right. But <laughs> if Lois won't leave Peter Griffin after all the shit he's pulled, then that makes this look, well, like a dip in the park, really. Yeah, yeah. 
But never mind, this isn't a sitcom. The kids obviously love him because he's fun and he, well, goofs off all the time. And he's attentive, to be fair. He's genuinely he interested in the kids. And... He is, just not in the boring ways that he leaves to the mother. No, exactly. Like He'll um, read all the books to the kids, he'll learn about what they're doing at school, but beyond that, he's got shortcomings. He clearly does love his kids and his family, and, you know, the intentions are good. That's never in question. Yeah, that's not a balanced household, so you can get why he's difficult to live with. Absolutely. <laughs> so, the point I'm making is it never makes you feel like... Despite the fact that he sets her up like that to the kids, it never makes you feel like the mother is the bad guy in all this. Which is good, because that would be a very easy trap to fall into. Yeah. I mean, the closest thing to a bad guy is their, like, is their neighbour. What's her, what's her name? The... Oh, I can't remember, but <laughs> she only appears once at the very beginning of the movie. For some reason, she had this character arc in the deleted scenes that got cut out. I don't know why they thought this would be a good idea. In the finished product, she's basically just a background character. You could cut that for time, but it also would be very detrimental to the plot and the pacing and the way you feel about the characters. Or we'll get to that with the deleted scenes, I guess. But Yeah. So right away, you empathise with all of these characters because you know where all of them are coming from. The kids just want their dad to stay at home. Like They don't, they don't want their dad to go... Well, it's understanding and sustainable change is frightening and, well, obviously they care about their parents. Daniel just seems to think that if they talk it over, everything can go back to normal. He doesn't, like, it's not until he, and this is one of the themes I really like about the movie, it's not until he goes undercover as Mrs. Doubtfire that he of necessity has to learn to do better and get used to that because... This is an idea I've always found very interesting. He sort of becomes the mask over the course of the film. Yeah, and you don't mean the um, you don't mean the Jim Carrey mask. No, no, that would be a very different movie. <laughs> although I would definitely watch the hell out of it. <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire, can you make me dinner? Somebody stop me! Smoking or non-smoking? Smoking. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but can you just not do that thing where <laughs> your eyes bulge out again? It scares the children. <laughs> yeah. okay, but I, I've always thought that, uh, um, given enough time, we sort of become what we pretend to be. Yeah, absolutely. And that that is a thing I believe, and you see it in this film where he becomes the more responsible, more attentive parent to his kids because he has to play the part of Mrs. Doubtfire, who is everything that the kids need, yes. although not, not everything that they realise they need or that he was. I thought you were going to do a Nolan and say not everything they deserve. No, no. <laughs> I mean, those poor, that, those oh, no, poor oh, kids. Yeah, and one of them is Mara Wilson, who's perfect in everything. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, those but, kids deserve everything that you can give them. Yes, and I, I'm it's, conditioned to hear Nolan quotes now. Yeah, she's the hero uh, that they need. She's yeah, the hero but they he, need. Th yeah, and the one they deserve, because through being Mrs. Doubtfire, he learns to become a better parent for his kids, to, to do the things that he wasn't doing before that needed doing, that also allow their mother to not be the bad guy all the time because he wasn't doing all the things that needed doing. Yeah, and what I think is fascinating is that everything he does as Mrs. Doubtfire is exactly what the judge wanted him to do as Daniel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, even though in the short term it would have been very hard for him to rarely see his children, if he just did that thing over the two months of networking with his boss and getting a good job and... Well, like I say, networking with his boss who he leaves a good impression with and he just focused on that, then all would have been well later on. I mean, the relationship probably wouldn't have worked out still, but he probably would have had joint custody of the children. Yeah, yeah. And that's um, the whole conceit and the whole tragedy of it, I suppose, in a way. I mean, it's weird to describe a comedy as a tragedy, but you know what I mean? There is tragedy, there is tragedy in it. Yeah, and there's always going to be, because it becomes clear about halfway through that it's going to end in tears. Yeah, yeah. Because how long can he keep up the facade? And 
the fact that he does it so well to begin with means he's in too deep to back out. Like that time he's invited out. Yeah, and as a child, it doesn't. You don't really realize these things. And when he does learn from being Mrs. Doubtfire and improve as a person, then he offers to come back and see the kids. And she says, "Oh, but we can't get rid of Mrs. Doubtfire. They love her too much." Exactly. It's like he's done his job too well. Yes. So there's no way that um, he can get out of this situation he's put himself in. And of course, he got found out by his two older children fairly early on in the movie. So it would only be a matter of time until the liar, liar woman or somebody else finds out the truth. Well, there was one of the deleted scenes where the mother finds out that the kids knew for a time. Yeah. And she says, how dare you encourage our children to deceive me? And that's a fair point. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely fair point. Definitely. <laughs> I mean, maybe she is a bit uptight at times, but to be honest, she's not the reason why it all went wrong. Yeah, it does paint her as a tiny bit vindictive, although maybe not on purpose in that one time where, you know, it's his one night with the kids. She brings them over an hour late and comes to pick them up an hour early and then comes, are my children ready yet? Yeah, that's about 20 minutes in, but I think that's quite well explained by the fact that it's the darkest moment for both him and her, really. Yeah, and like I said before, like none of them are perfect and divorce gets ugly. Yeah, because obviously he's going to be devastated about it because you get the feeling that he was more invested in the relationship than she was at that point. But it can't be easy for her either. Certainly then. Uh, I wouldn't say more invested, but, but less... Well, he was kind of in denial about the fact that it was over. Yeah, because exactly. It's a 14-year relationship. You really get the the impression that she has tried to keep it together. And only after 14 years of constantly dealing with his shit, yeah. she's finally like accepted that it's never going to get better. It's the finger that broke the dike. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not the expression. It's the um, oh, the camel, the camel. What does the camel do, Ollie? <laughs> Help the me. The straw that broke the camel's back. That's it. Is Sorry, the I got the expression I suspect yeah. you were thinking of. Yeah, I am an idiot of idioms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Uh, so, Ollie, how well did the film achieve its goals, and what were they? I would say very well. I mean, I would. I think a lot of the scenes, is particularly when they're trying on different lady looks for Robin Williams was just an exclu- just an excuse for him to do some of his improv. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean we had the same thing with Bicentennial Man where he does his robot stand-up. Yeah, well, when you've got Robin Williams, you're not going to not use Robin Williams as Robin Williams, are you? Exactly. No matter how serious or saccharine a um, Robin Williams movie might get, You've got to let him do his comedy for at least ten minutes, otherwise you're wasting your time with him. I mean, what even did you cast Robin Williams for if you're not going to do that? Exactly. You know, if you just want a serious actor, then just cast a serious actor who doesn't do stand-up. But one thing I think the movie does really well is 17 minutes in, and we already know everything we need to know about every character and how they relate to each other. Yeah, that's done very well. They, They knock it off in under 20 minutes. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. know his brother, who I really like, actually, Harvey Firestein. I think he's great in this film. It's yeah. a shame we don't really see him after the first half an hour much. Well, what he's there for is to be, like, the life preserver, the thing for him to fall back on. Yeah, he's basically like his Morpheus, in a way. Yeah. And, well, as soon as he says, can you make me a woman, he doesn't even ask questions. I love and, that. Like... That I think there are some aspects to the humour in this movie that haven't aged super well. I mean, I know it's a shock to him, but when the boy sees Mrs. Doubtfire peeing standing up, he freaks the hell out. But keep in mind, this was way before the internet. Uh, a lot of kids probably wouldn't have come across anything like that at that point, and for it to be a complete shock. And I remember my stepbrother used to quote this line all the time, where he goes, he's a he, he's a, she's a she, she thing. Uh, yeah. You know, that bit. I know, product product of its time, but, you know, maybe hasn't aged really well. Well, in fairness, if you have absolutely no warning, then it would be a shocker. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Not to anyone. And, and yeah, and it, it's not like he's doing it as a lifestyle anyway. No. Like, you know, it is a costume to yeah. him. 
The only bit that I would be critical of there is he's definitely a little bit too side eye with his wife and, well, with his ex-wife and her new guy. It's like, it does make me a little bit less sympathetic of him. Yeah, you can understand some of that, especially at first, but later on it feels a bit weird, like when he's making all these weird sexual remarks to James Bond. I don't know why. Well, when it when he's directly interfering with her new relationship, that's where he loses me a bit. <laughs> yeah, like at first you sort of understand it because it's not over the relationship, but it feels like having it that late in the movie at the dinner scene uh, is contradictory to his character arc where he's slowly beginning to accept it. Yeah. And... One scene I'm glad they deleted, and we're going to post a link to all these, is at the very end where he comes into the house straight after the meal where he's found out and has an argument with the mom. Yeah. I'm glad they cut that because that is completely counter to two hours of character development for both of them. Yeah. And it's basically the sort of argument they'd have at the beginning of the movie. And it doesn't feel right going back to square one after all of this. Yeah. Also, it feels a bit too raw considering everything that's just happened. And he does have to, to a point, learn that the divorce and the taking of the kids wasn't a thing that was done to him by her. It was an unfortunate thing that happened to both of them. And in the emotion of the moment, it probably did feel that way at first. Yeah. But later on, he grows to understand it. And one thing that I think this film does really well is the scenes where the mom is speaking to him as Mrs. Doubtfire about the relationship, why it didn't work out, about her feelings, because it gives them a sort of forum for discussion that they wouldn't usually have open to them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, he's limited in what he can say back. And that's brilliant because it means that he has to listen to what she has to say. He can't add his own two cents because he'll get found out. I mean, the the deceit is not good, but the dynamic that it creates is a good one for him being a bit more reflective. And maybe that's what helps him become a better person. Well, not maybe. It un- it unquestionably is. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I love those scenes. And as a child, you don't really get everything that's going on. But as an adult, you can fully appreciate it. Which is why I think it's a really good family movie. I wouldn't call it a children's movie because, funnily enough, like um, Daniel says in the movie, if adults can enjoy it, then children will enjoy it too. And I think that's quite a good way to look at media that's aimed towards younger people. Yeah, it's like, don't patronise kids. Yeah, and basically he's espousing the philosophy that a lot of people like the makers of Avatar The Last Airbender believe in, for example. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, That was a great show. Oh, yes. And I think this film is quite ahead of its time in many respects. Like you say, a few things don't age well, but what does age well Age is like fine wine. Oh, like the line when he's on the phone is like, I don't work with the males because I used to be one. Yeah. That pro- that joke probably wouldn't fly today. Well, it definitely wouldn't fly today. No, but it does go to show how uptight the mom is. Uh, but yeah, I really like his brother who is openly gay and in a relationship. All the family accept it. Um, and it's just there. It's not a big deal. And I like that in a 90s film. Also, like... Part of the tragedy of Mrs. Doubtfire is that he learns through Mrs. Doubtfire that he could already have been everything that his family needs, but it's too late now. Exactly. And that, that yeah, that's why I think it's easy to consider this film a tragedy. Well, again, it, it's very fair to all of the characters, even the new boyfriend, who has every reason to talk smack about... Daniel. Daniel! <laughs> why am I, I like, why am I struggling with that? I don't know, Ollie. I keep wanting to call him Richard and I have no idea why. Who the fuck's Richard? I have I don't know. <laughs> 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 okay, Daniel, yeah, he's fair to Daniel. Yeah, yeah. He well, he doesn't he resists the temptation to talk smack about him when the subject comes up and I know the temptation's got to be there. Oh but yeah. But he only says what he's heard. And what he's heard is from Sally Field. A very, yeah, a very jaded ex-wife of the man he's talking about. Who doesn't have a lot of reason to say nice things about her ex to her current boyfriend. You just wouldn't do that. 
No. You know, you know, you don't talk favorably about your ex to someone you're dating, especially like early on. Imagine that on a date. Oh my god, my ex, he was brilliant. You know, oh, we had, we had the best uh, relationship. Yes. Why are you telling me this? Yeah, something tells me you've got your ex on your mind. Call me when it's over, over. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> yeah, that that's how that would go. So obviously he's heard nothing too good about him. Yeah, and it's an informal conversation that he's obviously not supposed to be privy to where he refers to his ex as a loser and... To be fair, he's not wrong, in a way. In a way. I mean, yeah. I mean, you could use those words to his description. Although, I wouldn't have called him a loser. Just like no. But you're too polite and bashful. This is James Bond with the confidence of James Bond. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I pretended jokingly to not know that Pierce Brosnan was James Bond while we were watching the film. <laughs> oh no, his most famous credit was obviously Mamma Mia. <laughs> yeah. Thing is, I can't bring myself to um, hate um, Pierce Brosnan. I think uh, he could even he could even do an ABBA movie where he sings a lot, and I'd still like him. <laughs> he was a centaur in Percy Jackson. <laughs> where are those happy days? They seem so hard to find. A centaur, you say? So yeah, it was quite well cast actually, which makes him unique as far as the Percy Jackson movie goes. Well, yeah, I mean he was perfect for the role since he is actually, in fact, a centaur in real life, and not many people realise that. <laughs> they cover uh, it up well. It made the sex scenes in James Bond really difficult to film, though. I imagine it would. Yeah, is that why he's always shot dead, like facing the camera dead on? Exactly. So that you can't see the legs behind him. Yeah, you got to admit he had a leg up on the competition, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh. What even is this conversation? Uh, anyway, no. um, uh, we were talking about how well the film achieved its goals and what they were. I think as a family movie, it does an amazing job because we've got Chris Columbus, who was basically born to do family movies. I think literally, I think they grew him in a vat, able to create <laughs> things like Home Alone. <laughs> and, but, I, I, I mean... I'm in a situation where my parents were separated before I could even cognitively remember, if that makes sense. So I've yeah. not really experienced a divorce in the family, as it were. I have experienced a divorce in the family, but it wasn't my actual parents. Because, well, they likewise were separated before I could remember. Yeah. <laughs> so. But I imagine that this movie was probably very poignant and, uh, well was necessary for a lot of people and probably helped them through a lot. And any movie that yeah. does that is worth its salt, really. Yeah. And, well, it would also let kids know that it's okay to not like what's happening. And Yeah. I mean, the kids are never presented as unreasonable or over-emotional because they're right to be upset with everything that's going on. Well, again, no one's presented unfairly. That's... Yeah. And I like how it tackles that it's not good in the long run for a couple that don't love each other and don't get on to be in a relationship for the sake of the children because in the long run they'll be better off for the parents being happier even if that means separating and also it doesn't um, say that a family that is separated isn't a real family because families take all sorts of forms and I really liked that monologue at the end from Mrs Doubtfire then a TV show character basically giving that as the message to end the movie on. Yeah, it's better to have happy parents, because uh, unlike economic prosperity, happiness actually does trickle down. <laughs> uh, well, he does the Ronald Reagan impression, so... Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, that, that's a lovely film, uh, for that reason. So, yeah. did it exceed your expectations, Ollie? It did, yeah. I don't remember it being this... Go it was supremely well balanced as a film if you know what I mean perfectly balanced as all things should be yeah um, it's paced pretty well it's about as long as it could get away with being I think because I was yeah. feeling the runtime any more and I would, I probably would have clocked out yeah I mean there were 30 minutes of deleted scenes I don't know whatever made them think it would be a good idea to make a three and a half hour no a two and a half hour long movie yeah I mean, if it's Lord of the Rings, it's an epic and you're along for the ride, but if it's just a family story, two hours is enough. I like how much writing went into it, but I am, on the whole, glad they cut what they did. Everything that needs to be in there is in there. 
I'm honestly astonished that some of those scenes lasted as late into the process as they did. Yeah. I mean, there are some that are fine and I would happily have kept in there, but were obviously cut for time. Yeah, the two that I would pick to keep would be the dance scene with the mom teaching the kids how to dance because it's yeah that is definitely the one I would keep and the one with the guy on the bus it's just such a sweet scene I love that scene because there's two scenes of this bus driver where he compliments um, Mrs Doubtfire and just has nice interactions with her and we don't see a third and these things usually come in threes and the third is him basically owning up and saying after he he's asked out as Mrs Doubtfire I'm actually a man. And he just says, well, A, you could have fooled me, and uh, B, I still think you're attractive. And I think that's just a really sweet scene. Says, I, I still think you're beautiful, and good luck with everything. <laughs> like, I really like you know, that. It's just nice. I wish they kept it in. I mean, I know we've got enough uh, wholesomeness as it is being a... Uh... I absolutely understand why they cut it, as well as the dance scene for time. But the dancing scene in particular really shows how much happier the mom can be if she's yeah. given the chance. And it shows that she's like, not completely a stick in the mud, because she's not. Yeah. She just has put up with a lot of shit, both yeah. at work and at home. She was forced to be the stick in the mud because Daniel wasn't pulling his weight as much as he should have when they were together. So yeah. that that left all the stick in the mud duties to her. And now that Mrs Doubtfire has taken a lot of the work in that regard off her shoulders, she's free to loosen up a bit. And I really would have kept that scene in because showing is better than telling. I mean, it does establish that yeah. she doesn't like how much of a stick in the mud that she is yeah. and that she wishes she could be more fun for the kids. Oh, yeah. That's not as effective as showing it. Yeah, it's one of those show-don't-tell sorts of things, and they do tell it several times, and we take her word for it. But it would have yeah. been nice to show it just once. I would have swapped that scene with uh, Mrs. Doubtfire talking to James Bond about genitals and herpes and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I would have... That did not need to be in the film. It's funny, but... like, It's implied that a conversation between the two of them would be awkward anyway, so just cut away from it. Exactly. We could just show three seconds of them being awkward, not knowing what to say to each other, and you establish that just as well. Yeah. Also, I don't like that he's still pining after her that late into the movie, yeah. where he's seen more than enough that the relationship is not going to work out. And yeah, and that dancing scene could have been a pivotal scene for him when he realizes that it is actually for the best that he leave it alone. Yeah, because he doesn't get to be a part of it, but that's probably for the best. It's like he doesn't have to be a part of every fun thing that happens to his kids. Yeah. It's like... And he's starting to realise, you can tell in that scene, what his wife was talking about when she says that he hogs all the fun and leaves her with nothing. Well, exactly. And it's good for the kids to have a happy mom and a happy dad. Uh, that's not being heteronormative, by the way. It doesn't matter who the parents are. It's just one Two happy two. parents. Yeah, two happy parents, non-gender specific. Yeah. Or one, <laughs> if there's only one. Or loads, if that's yeah. what you're into. It's nice to have a happy household, is what you are saying. Yeah, exactly. I digress. <laughs> yeah. uh. Is there an element of the film that particularly appeals, Ollie? Robin Williams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you've got um, a Robin Williams movie, he is the star. I don't care if it's Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest, or what it is. He is the reason yeah. you go and see that movie. Disney's Aladdin. No, it's Robin Williams' is Aladdin. Yeah. Hell, what's that, Ollie? Uh... uh. Probably a door shutting this it house. It sounded like he had a thunderous wall. erection when I said the word Aladdin. Oh, bloody hell, Arabian Nights. <laughs> carry, carry on, Ollie. Uh, uh, yeah, so Robin Williams. I think um, it's a really good character piece, and I like those. Yeah. Uh, but it's not just a one person character piece, like you could argue that Bicentennial Man is, because. We haven't even talked about how funny it is. Like we've been going on for God knows how long, but so, some scenes in this film are hilarious. Like I, this is maybe maybe me being a bit nostalgic for when I was younger. I still really like uh, what I used to laugh at is the face cream scene where it's just <laughs> face plants into a cake. Hello, hello. I just and, love that. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like 
he's clearly just doing whatever he can to get out of the room. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love these farcical scenes. I'm not usually a huge farce person. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> If anyone can pull it off, it's Robin Williams. Yeah, regardless of what my counselor calls me. But if anyone can pull it off, it's Robin Williams. He makes it funny. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say the humour. Obviously, that's the main selling point. There's lots of humorous moments. I like how we sort of get this gradual change in the characters as well. I say the characters because unlike, say, Bicentennial Man, which exists for the development of one character and one character only, and everyone else serves to be a part of his journey, this is one where multiple characters change over time. Yeah. And have arcs. Yeah. And I think that's probably part of the reason why this one's considered a magnum opus, and the other one is not even considered a magnum ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> magnum ice cream. That, that's a very good turn of phrase you just did there. Thank you, I might Well, use it well done. Later. Thank you, Ollie. <laughs> yeah. um, Melts away before your eyes. Yeah, you do see a change in the characters over time, and it's often in reaction to another change, because when his ex comes over and sees he's tidied up the place and how well he's doing, Yeah, like w- with the kids, Yeah, and he says, like, why don't you just let me look after the kids for now? And she doesn't seem opposed to the idea now, because before, when like everything's still fresh yeah. and the place is a mess, and they're really like sarcastic with each other. Yeah, like they're eating <laughs> shit food, and she comes in, is like, "Oh, well, I can see you're living the lifestyle." When he asks again part way through, the reason she says no is because she doesn't want to get rid of Mrs. Doubtfire. And I believe that's genuine. Yeah, that's the only reason. Like, at this point, she's seen that he has turned his life around and she'd happily let him look after the children. Yeah, but they love Mrs. Doubtfire too much. (laughs) And he's finding the time to make the effort with the children, despite having to hold down a busy job and a nanny job, which obviously she doesn't know about. (laughs) Well, she does, but (laughs) Not, <laughs> but she doesn't know it's him. But yeah, I love how Mrs. Doubtfire gives him a mask to have these conversations with her, like I said. It gives him a mask to communicate with his children. And, well, he can't be selfish as Mrs. Doubtfire because he's not there. <laughs> yeah, to reap for benefits. Like, I mean, he did, but f- for once he has to... Like when his wife talks about him, like you said, he can't be selfish in that conversation, he has to just sit there and listen. He has to just do what the kids need him to do and not be the party animal like he was at his son's birthday. And, well, he learned a lot from that, you can tell. Yeah, and I like that we've got, well, the two main adult characters learning through the movie and having proper characters. But also, but also, what he did was fucked up. Oh, yeah. Like, he invented a persona in order to deceive his wife into letting him be around their kids. That is fucked up. It is. And it doesn't shy away from the fact that that is fucked up. And the judge isn't wrong at the end to, well, restrict his access to his children because for all he knows, he could be some sort of sinister person who's acting. Yeah. Because it's hard to take somebody's sincerity at face value when they've spent so much time deceiving people. When they've spent the last three months lying to everyone around them. Including the um, a representative of the law by the way, because there was the lie a lie woman who was tasked with yeah. looking after him and watching him. <laughs> yeah, so I like that the movie never really portrays this as an absolutely good thing. It brings out the best in him, but it also brings out the worst in him in some ways. And, yeah. it's up, and that, what I like is, the ending gives him agency to realise what was so bad about what he was doing and what was so good about it. Yeah. Because it's bad that he was deceiving so many people and leaving them in an option where there would inevitably be heartbreak. Yeah. But it was good that he was making more effort to be with and, uh, well, pay attention to his kids and improve himself in his own job and home life. Yeah, but also... But he didn't. But also, he didn't need Mrs. Doubtfire for any of that. That's the interesting conceit. Yeah, Mrs. Doubtfire allowed him to be like the person he always could have been, but 
Well, I mean, if he was that person from the beginning, then... There wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, the relationship (laughs) may have been salvaged, and his relationship with the children would have been a lot better, and the children would have a happier life he would have, but then there would be no story, would there? Yeah, and he does keep Mrs. Doubtfire alive, because she's a character now, because he accidentally uh, didn't change out of it when he sat down with the TV producer guy. I really like that scene. I like how they just get progressively more drunk with each other and he just keeps slipping up more and more. Yeah. And because he's got to save face and salvage it, like, meet your new host of the TV show, which is not what he planned on, but it turns out to be a really good, you know... (laughs) Because I like that, because it establishes him as a talented person, which is very easy to do when you've got a genuinely talented voice actor like Robin Williams in the role. Yeah, yeah. It's playing to the actor's strengths in the best possible way. And I like that it does end up rewarding him because he needs to find steady work with his talents being recognised and him getting a career. Everything fits together really well as well. It does. I mean, this is a masterclass in how to not only make a movie, but how to piece it together. That's um, one of the things that makes those deleted scenes so... uh... Fascinating. Yeah, because there was this whole like subplot where he was viciously uh, getting the neighbor woman to kill her flowers by telling her to put dog piss on them. This actually happened, by the way. This was going to be an arc in the movie. It wasn't just one scene, it was an arc. Yeah, it, there was at least four of them in the yeah. deleted scenes. <laughs> the neighbor was sort of this vindictive Karen character who was offended by everything and did her best to try and ruin his reputation. Yeah. It felt too much like kicking the dog, if that makes sense, and it didn't add anything to the plot. It's Yeah, and it just made it just made Daniel less sympathetic. Exactly, because he had to be equally vicious back and yeah, it, it just doesn't feel right. It's, yeah. I don't understand a lot of these children's movies, particularly animated ones that introduce a contrived villain. The, it doesn't really need that tension because the yeah. drama is between the characters. It's not from an external source. Yeah, th- there's there's no reason for that to remain in there. It doesn't add anything to the plot. It yeah. makes the runtime even longer and makes us less sympathetic to Daniel. So Also, like... it takes away from the gravitas of the serious moments where you keep cutting away to talk about piss every five minutes. Yeah. It's not some sort of filthy Frank movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and also there was a deleted scene where he goes to his, his daughter's spelling bee and starts an argument in the middle of it with a, a random woman and also his ex-wife. And that paints him as a lot less sympathetic. Yeah, and it screws up his kids in the spelling bee. I mean, it makes the mother more sympathetic. But again, it's perfectly balanced as all things should be. I don't think it's worth the trade-off. No, and it's the not. extra runtime. No, it's it, it because sometimes the setup doesn't make the payoff worth it. Yeah, but as a film about divorce and about family and dealing with that, I think it accomplishes its goals incredibly well. And it's also a very funny Robin Williams movie. Oh yeah, yeah. I, well, so many moments that you can laugh at. Uh... Yeah. Uh, it's just even small lines like like a snow cone in Phoenix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and the interactions between Harvey Firestein and his mom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Ollie, how does this film hold up today? Uh, I think it holds up pretty well. Uh like there are a couple of jokes here or there that haven't aged well and probably wouldn't fly today. But that that it's only a couple and the rest of the film is just it's it's a joy to watch. <laughs> Oh, absolutely, and it's one of those films that has quite a good message and means well, and yeah, I think this should be a staple from now till the end of days. To be honest, this film could have got away with being less good than it is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, imagine if all the deleted scenes got kept in and some of the sweeter scenes got took out. It would have basically been like a 90s Adam Sandler movie. (laughs) Well, or a 2000s Adam Sandler movie. Or an Adam Sandler movie that isn't grown-ups. <laughs> uh. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I like some of the 90s Adam Sandler me movies. Me too. Though. I wouldn't even call them guilty pleasures because I'm famously shameless. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it holds up as well as it always will. They've created something before mobile phones and the internet that somehow doesn't feel alien in the time of mobile phones and the internet. No, it doesn't really dwell on technology, though, does it? No, no, it, it's a, it's an inner story, a bit like Bicentennial Man. I mean, we don't care that that's set in the future. It doesn't really matter other than the fact that he's a robot. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> was the film received appropriately at the time? To be honest, I'm not sure how it was received. Let's find out together. Uh, I think yeah. really well. Well, it's regarded as a classic, so I would assume so. There's a musical of Mrs. Doubtfire. That's interesting. Okay. Apparently it was based on a book. That's really weird. It was based on a book. Really? I want to find this book and read it because, yeah, I didn't know that it was. Very interesting. It was also um, produced by Robin Williams' wife. <laughs> oh, um, wow. Okay. Do you know what the budget was, Ollie? What was it? Twenty-five million, so a quarter of a bicentennial man, a bicentennial limb, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> wow, I, I'm surprised. I would have thought it would cost more than that. Yeah, I mean, obviously maybe having... this movie is the reason Robin Williams was so expensive for bicentennial man. Yeah, well, it's funny you say that because it did make four hundred forty-one point three million. Oh wow. Do you know? What? I think it is fair to say that um, Robin Williams was already well established at this point. You know, Good Morning Vietnam, Dead Poets Society, Mork and Mindy. He being a very well-known stand-up comedian, so it's not like he needed this for his career to develop. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? He was obviously the main draw, but it obviously did well beyond that because I'm well. We know for a fact that there's Robin Williams movies that did a lot worse than this. Yeah, I think it was received very well. It was received appropriately because it did, well, it did really well. And it's regarded as a classic. And I agree. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm also, and I hate saying these kinds of things, but I'm glad that the sequel that was talked about for so long never happened. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I feel like every character arc was satisfactorily concluded. I feel like any story where they get back together would be contrary to the message of the film. Uh, and I feel like anything other than what we saw would be, what's the word, superfluous. Yeah, yeah. This this is a one-and-done kind of movie. A sequel wouldn't have helped. Like, no, it would have to be one hell of a sequel. Yeah, it's like, it's like Toy Story. Somehow they found a way, but I think very uniquely, only a few Pixar properties can somehow create a sequel out of a self-contained story and make it good. Yeah, yeah. Where do you even go after this movie? I don't know. Uh, it would be interesting to see like a show of Mrs. Doubtfire's show. Yeah. Because we see a few scenes of that. But Mrs. Doubtfire would have to would have to figure heavily into the plot because it's a Mrs. Doubtfire movie. So. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can't really have a Mrs. Doubtfire movie without Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah. Uh, actually, I do want to see that TV show. I want to find out what's up with Mr. Sprinkles. <laughs> yeah. What is his deal? What is his MO? Why is he a postman? Uh, what's his life? No one knows. And I want to. I will. Mr. Sprinkles, I'm going to find you and I'm going to find out what you are. So, in conclusion, Ollie. Yeah. Uh, this was a right laugh. And it was a genuinely heartwarming movie. And I'm glad we got to sit here and watch it again. I would say it speaks for itself, but we've spent 50 minutes talking about it, so... Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It's one of those you really have to see to believe, and it's an experience film, in a way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to quote Arthur, it's a simple message and it comes from the heart. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would recommend this to any family of humans... Yeah. <laughs> or any family right. of aliens. I think it would be a good introduction to an alien species, actually, show that we've got heart and... Um, yeah. That Robin Williams was probably a better example of a human being than anyone alive today. <laughs> uh. 
So you know, I wouldn't disagree. Take me to your leader. Oh, that's a bad idea. I'll take you to Robin Williams instead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, after after sitting through a good old tearjerker of a Robin Williams movie, they're not going to want to invade. No, no. Uh, they, they might ask um, what the deal with the neighbour was, but that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, lovely. I, I had a good time watching this. Yeah, yeah. What's your conclusion? Uh, my conclusion... Well, I thought I already gave it, but um, I, I've always liked this movie. It's one of those where I can read into it more the older I get. There's, lo- I mean, obviously a lot of the adult jokes would have gone over my head at the time. But there's a lot of yeah. small moments that you notice and pick up on, uh, like the subtleties. Um, like one scene I really like is when Mrs. Doubtfire is talking to his daughter on their first day where she was particularly harsh with him and then at the end she comes out of the house as Mrs. Outfire's leaving to thank her for everything she's been doing and apologise for being a brat. It's a very earnest movie, isn't it? A lot of it, a lot of the movies in the 90s are very earnest. We just did Air Force One last week. It's a very earnest movie. I mean, I don't know, unless you lived in um, either um, Kosovo or Bosnia, you were probably having a pretty good time in the 90s. Yeah, the 90s were a much less cynical time, weren't they? Yeah, and I think that's part of the appeal for films like this. It's a Yeah, and I think a lot of the art of that period reflects that, and that's just lovely. Yeah, and I like how a story about divorce from the 90s is somehow more heartwarming than a story about how good life is in the 2010s, 2020s. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> but yeah, going back to that scene very briefly, I like how you could clearly see it in Robin Williams' eyes how hard that scene was uh, for him not being able to like say he felt the same way to his daughter about how hard things have been. Because uh, he really had to be restrained and it must have been so difficult for him. And um, I just love how well acted that scene is. All of the scenes are well acted, actually. Yeah, everyone. Actors at this level generally aren't bad, are they? No, no. No, <laughs> no. it always annoys me when people are like, oh, the acting's corny. It's like, well, is it though? Yeah. <laughs> so, next week, next week, we're going to be watching Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, I believe. Yeah, it's a fourth video. It's a, it's a Potter. So we will gobble it up next week, and you can be there with us on the launch on Sundays at 6.15 every time because YouTube don't like round numbers for some reason. So have we got to come here, the Goblet of Fire? <laughs> yes, Ollie, we're going to review the Goblet of Fire. <laughs> okay. okay, see you next <laughs> week and don't forget to subscribe for Shadix. Yeah, and share this around if you liked it. And join our Discord disco. Yeah, we've got a Discord server now. Link in the description. Yep, yeah, see you there and see you next week. <laughs> See you next week. Goodbye.